So we are talking about trigonometric substitutions today, which is one of my favorite things. I feel like, I know I've said that a lot, but really one of my favorite things. I just love integration techniques, period. These take some time, just like everything else. Um, so you saw when you read through the book, right? Let's just kind of put down our table and then we'll we'll do just examples. That's what I want to do for you. So um, if so, our table kind of, if the integrand, right, which is the stuff inside, the an integral, if the integrand contains, right, the following kind of type of um, algebraic expression, then the, here's the substitution we're going to make, right? So I'm going to give you those first two columns in your book on the test. You need to know um, how to change it, though. So these are basically what I'm writing down right now is what I'll give you. So if the integrand contains um, a number, it doesn't necessarily have to be a perfect square. Okay, just realize that. Um, it doesn't have to be a perfect square, but I just want you to, you know, it's usually going to be a perfect square. So if we have a number minus x squared, the substitution is going to be sine. And that substitution that you're going to make is you're going to let x equal... Um, whatever the square root is of that number times sine of theta. Now it's quite important, um, and and maybe you don't care about this as much, but I'm going to make you care, is that you understand where theta is. So let's remember um, when we dealt with sine inverse, because sometimes um, we're going to have to solve for theta, because we might get like theta is, um, so, theta is something, and we need to figure out what, um, what that theta is, then we need to know where does theta live. As I'm sure you remember in trigonometry class, right, if I were to solve for sine here, you know, I could take x over a equals sine of theta, and then I would take the inverse. Now this, if you remember from trig class, presented a bit of a problem for us, because remember sine inverse must be a function, so it must spit out only one angle for every input that comes in here. And we know that that's not always true, right? We know that the sine of 30 degrees is the same as the sine of 150 degrees. Um, so, so the issue with that is that we have to restrict where theta is. So if you remember sine inverse, um, put some restrictions on theta, and where theta must live, is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So if you think of that in quadrants, in 1 and 4, but thinking of it as here's my negative pi over 2 and then any angle through pi over 2, okay? Um, that We have a, you know, it gives us a quadrant where sine is positive. It gives us a quadrant where sine is negative so we can get all values of sine in that. So again, if we have a number um, minus uh, x squared, we're going to do the substitution that x equals a sine of theta. And this is also for, we, we should mention this in general, this is for an absolute value of x is less than a, is less than or equal to a, just so that we can keep that positive. Because a lot of times it's going to be under the square root, and so we want to make sure that stays positive. All right, so that's the first substitution. The next, and by the way, you could we could use cosine also, but it's just general practice to use um, sine, and then we don't deal with some of the negative stuff that negative stuff that cosine brings. Um, a squared plus x squared. The substitution we're going to use for that, as you saw, was a times tangent of theta. Um, tangent doesn't worry about that. Obviously, this is always positive, no matter what's going to happen, because anytime you square something, it's positive. So we don't have to have that restriction on x. And where does theta live when, oh, not equal to, um, when we're looking at inverse tangent theta, is it's also, it's almost the same as sine inverse. Um, but it's just we can't actually equal pi over 2 because the tangent of pi over 2 is undefined. So again, that's my substitution for a squared minus x squared. For a squared plus x squared, my substitution is going to be x equals a tangent theta. And then the last one that you saw, what could I have if I had something like x squared minus a squared? Then we decide we do a equals, excuse me, x equals a secant of theta. Now there's this one's a little bit more <laughs> to talk about, but um, here's what we got. Because if you look at x equals a secant of theta, this is going to be true. Where does theta live, basically, right? Theta is going to be in the first quadrant between 0 and pi over 2, not equal to pi over 2, because the cosine of pi over 2 is 0 and secant is 1 over cosine, so that would be 
that. That's if x is greater than or equal to a, because what that ends up doing is that makes this whole thing, this whole thing here positive. And so if that's positive, I want to spit out an angle in the first quadrant, which is where secant is positive. If it's negative, however, then I know that secant inverse is going to spit out an angle in the second quadrant. Okay, and that's if x, when are we going to get something that's negative if x is less than or equal to a? All right, and that's my substitution for um, secant tan, or those are my three substitutions for sine tangent and secant. Okay, and again, please understand that the, that's where theta is. You will need to state where theta lives. Okay, we don't want to go ahead and assume. We want to know where they are, and these will be given to you on the test, right? But you need to remember to state those Anytime we make this substitution, a substitution like this, and we state we're going to be doing that, we have to make sure that theta applies to these rules so that when we take the sine inverse, we have a function. Okay, all right, let's do some examples. These are so fun. I really love doing these. I just think they're the best time. And, and of course, we're going to see, you know, why this works. So let's look at this example first square root of 1 over the square root of 4 plus x squared, okay? So we clearly see, right, that it's going to be a tangent substitution. So what I like to usually do is I like, so I know I'm going to use a squared plus x squared, right? I know I'm going to do the substitution a x equals a tangent theta, right? Um, so the, first of all, what is my a? My a in this case is 2. So here are my substitutions I'm going to make. I'm going to let x equal 2 tangent of theta, and then again, I'm going to state where theta lives, for theta between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, not equal to it because tangent is undefined at pi over 2. Okay, so I know I'm grabbing a theta right in the first or the fourth quadrant, okay, not equaling the y-axis. Um, so once you make that substitution, we have to think about what's going to happen here. So I know that this x right here is going to be replaced with the two tangent theta. But now what else do I need to replace? I have to replace that dx. So remember, you're not, you cannot mix variables. So I don't want to have some x's in the integrand and some theta's in the integrand. So how do I get rid of that dx? Well, just like we do in regular u substitution, I'm going to take the derivative of both sides. So the derivative of tangent is secant squared d theta. This d theta you must put there. If you don't put that there, then you're not going to have a d theta, then you won't be able to do the antiderivative. So let's see what's going to happen here. Oh, whoops. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. x squared. All right, so let's do the substitution. So what does dx become? So you can see that dx is equal to the 2 secant squared theta d theta. So I'm going to write that. So I have 2 secant squared theta and then I'll put the d theta afterward because it doesn't really matter where the d theta goes. In the denominator here, I have instead of 4 plus x squared, right, what am I going to have? I'm going to have 4 plus 2 tangent of theta squared. So if I square that, don't forget you must square the 2, that's 4. And then when I square the tangent, I simply get tangent squared of theta. Ah, and I simply am running out of room here. And it bothers me. There we go. Okay. All right, so now why does the substitution work? This is why I don't want you to necessarily always, you know, that third column in your book, you can memorize that if you would like to. I'm not going to give it to you. But you do need to remember, and maybe we should write these down. Um, I don't have room up there. Let's just write them down right here. You must know people with Pythagorean identities. So you need to know that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. You need to know that tangent squared plus 1 equals secant squared. That's the Those are the main two you're going to use, but you know we might as well throw in cotangent squared plus 1 is cosecant squared. Okay, so if I look at what's happening over here, if I just do a little, I'm just going to do a little bit of work underneath my integrand right here. If I factor a 4 out, I get 1 plus tangent squared theta, right? So if I have 1 plus tangent squared of theta, what is tangent squared, 1 plus tangent squared theta? Sure enough, it's actually equal to secant squared. So look at what this becomes then. I have 2 secant squared theta still on top. On the bottom now, I'm going to have that 4 still, but then this right here is going to be replaced with secant squared theta. Guys, that's why you do it. It's not magic. <laughs> I mean, math I think is kind of magic no matter what, but 
Um, there's a reason we did that substitution. We did that substitution so that when you factor out that four, you will be able, you will get a one plus tangent squared, and then you can rewrite that as secant squared. Okay. All right. So now let's simplify this a little bit. So what do we get here? I get two secant squared of theta all over. Now we have to be a little bit careful here. So the square root of four is two. Now, when I, when I square root a squared, we have to be careful, and I'm going to put absolute value here. Now, the absolute value actually isn't going to really matter because we're going to get a natural log, and we put absolute values anyway around natural log. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I want you to understand that if I square a negative and then square root it, right, I'm always going to get a positive, or if I square a positive and then square root it, I always get a positive. So we have to put those absolute values there just so, so we know that, okay? Um, then what do we have here? So my twos cancel. I can cancel one of the secants out. So I'll just be left with whatever my, I'll just have secant of theta. Now, what, why did I, why was I able to get rid of those absolute values? Well, the reason I was able to get rid of those absolute values is if you notice, look at where theta lives. Theta lives, right, in quadrant one or quadrant four. So I really could have probably just said, don't worry about the absolute values. So here I could have said, well, I know secant of theta is greater than zero because secant of theta is greater than zero for theta between negative pi over two and pi over two. Again, why? Because that's quadrants one and four and secant is one over cosine. And I know cosine is positive in quadrants one and four. So that's why I can just go ahead and cancel and get a secant. We saw in that last section, I think, no, where the 8.1, our first section, that what is the antiderivative of secant of theta? It's the natural log of absolute value secant of theta plus tangent of theta. That's one of those that I'll give you plus C. Oh my goodness. <laughs> these are so much fun. I love doing these. All right. So once we get to that, though, notice, people, we started off, right? Come on. We started off in X's put some sparkly stuff around that. We start off with X's, you best be ending with X's as well. So let's rewrite, usually when I get to this point, I rewrite what I know. I know my substitution was X equals two tangent of theta. And what do I need to replace here? I need to replace secant of theta and tangent of theta. So what we're gonna do, we're just going back to trig, which I know is one of your favorite classes, is I'm gonna divide by two, and I see that the tangent of theta is X over two. So if I'm just gonna, draw a little triangle here. Oh no, don't do that. Let's see here. There we go. I'm going to draw, <laughs> maybe the computer's trying to draw it better for me. I'm going to draw a right triangle. Pretend that's a right triangle. If this is my theta, and even if this theta was in, you know, um, the fourth quadrant, it would, it'd be fine, right? So I could, I could draw my theta in the second or in the first quadrant, or if I wanted to put it like this, I could put it in the fourth quadrant. But without loss of generality, I'm just gonna put this in the first quadrant. What is tangent? Tangent is opposite over adjacent. And so what would this side be? This would be x squared plus four, right? Because that would tell me that two squared plus x squared equals c squared. And if I square root it, we get the square root of x squared plus four. So what does that tell me then? Well, I can find secant of theta, right? That's one over cosine of theta. Cosine of theta would be adjacent over hypotenuse. But I'm gonna flip those because it's secant and not cosine. So I'm gonna do hypotenuse over adjacent. And then tangent of theta, I don't need to look at the triangle, right? Because I know what tangent of theta is, it's x over two. So what is my final answer then? My final answer, I know it looks a little complicated, but it works, is the natural log of x squared plus four all over two plus x over two, all plus c, and we're done. Simple as that. But see how powerful trig substitutions are, right? I know that looked like a lot. <laughs> it is. Um, but if you were to try and evaluate this some other way, I mean, you can't do substitution to it, right? We don't have the derivative of x squared sitting there. You can maybe try parts, but that's going to be gross. I mean, if you let u equal that square root thing, the derivative is more complicated than it. I can't let dv equal their square root stuff because that's actually what I'm trying to find. So the only thing that I can really do with this, unless I really try some tricky u substitution, is um, is to do a trick sub. They're so useful. And we'll see them come up. Whoa, whoa. All right.
let's do another one just because that was that was just a good time. I don't care who you are. That's just fun. <laughs> All right, let's look at this this integral. So the first thing I'm going to notice is, you know, the hard part about the next test or dealing with this chapter really is understanding. I'm not going to tell you what to do to solve it. So you need to figure out what you're going to do. Problem with this one is I can't really do a U substitution, right? If I could, if I let U equal nine minus x squared, then it'd be its derivative. Um, I have an x squared, I don't have just an x, so I wouldn't be able to get rid of it. Um, parts would be uh, gross. <laughs> but what I do notice is I have this 9 minus x squared, right? Which is going to be, I could use a um, sine substitution. So I notice in this case that my a is 3, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and let x equal 3 sine of theta, and where does theta live? Theta is going to be between negative pi over 2. It can equal pi over 2, that's fine, because sine of pi over 2 is 1, and negative pi over 2 is negative 1. All right, cool, so I'm going to let x equal 3 sine of theta. Um, so this x here will be replaced, this x here will be replaced. What else do we have to replace? We have to replace that dx, right? Let me get rid of that really quick. All right, so I need to find dx. So what is dx? Well, the derivative of sine is cosine. So we get 3 cosine d theta. Okay, and now we're just, let's start doing this. So I have x squared all over the square root of 9 minus x squared dx. And let's just start replacing stuff. All right, so x squared. So what is x? x is 3 sine theta. So if I square that, I get 9 sine squared of theta. So on the bottom, same thing, I'm going to get 9 minus 9 sine squared of theta. And then um, what is my dx? Well, it looks like I said my dx was 3 cosine of theta d theta. Okay, all right, so now it's the simplification time. So this stuff right here, I'm going to factor a 9 out, and I'm left with 1 minus sine squared of theta again this is the whole reason you did it people so what is 1 minus sine squared that is exactly the same as cosine squared right from our pythagorean identity so let's see what we got i'm still not going to quite simplify completely or i'm not going to combine anything yet because i want to see what's going to happen and i'm showing you you know every single step if you can see that the square root of 9 cosine squared is 3 cosine theta then you know, you could you could go ahead and jump to that step. But I just want to show you, I took all of this right here, and what does the inside of that square root become? 9 cosine squared. All right, so I still have 9 sine squared on top. On the bottom, we get just 3 cosine of theta. Now, do I need the absolute values? I do not need the absolute values, because look at where theta lives. Theta lives in quadrant 1 and quadrant 4, and I know that cosine, because cosine are your x values, cosine is positive in quadrants one and four. So I don't need absolute values when, by square, square rooting a squared, okay? Because I know that cosine of theta is positive. All right, so look at what happens here. This is kind of why I didn't really do anything. I waited until um, I got to here to simplify. Um, you know, I could have combined the nine and the three, but you might just wait for a little bit and see what happens. All right, so what is my integral? I get, now I'm gonna bring the nine out and I get the integral of sine squared of theta. So now a lot of times these trig substitutions, because you're going to trig functions, um, a lot of times these trig substitutions will result in, um, will result in a trig integral, which is what we just did in the last section, right? So we're going to be looking at how do I deal with, you know, a sine squared. So remember how I dealt with the sine squared is the sine squared of theta, we use the half angle formula, equals one minus cosine of ah two theta all over two. And actually a lot of time, what I actually like to write the half angle formulas as, is I like to think of this as one half times one minus cosine give myself a little bit more room cosine of 2 theta because then I'm just going to bring that one half out all right so the sine squared I'm going to bring the one half out that becomes nine halves and then this becomes one minus cosine of 2 theta d theta a lot of stuff going on here right this is kind of like a math teacher's dream because then I can test you not only on a trig sub but I can also test you and your trig and girls at the same time sorry if you can hear my children um yelling 
I promise you they are just um, playing <laughs> and and everyone is perfectly fine. It, I appreciate their enthusiasm. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and take the antiderivative. Notice I have 1 becomes theta. Um, the antiderivative of cosine of 2 theta, I need to bring that 1 half down here because um, of that 2 inside. And then the antiderivative of cosine is just plain old sine. All right, so I started off with x's. So what do I what do I know? This this one's a little bit trickier than the other ones, and this is why this is a good one to do. So first off, I know that x is equal to two sine of theta. Okay. So first, what I need to do is I need to figure out what is theta. So I'm going to go ahead and solve for theta. X over two equals the sine of theta. So what is theta? Because I know that theta is you know, in the first and second quadrant, I know I can take the sine inverse of it and I know that will be a function. So I know right away that that theta is actually going to be sine inverse of x over two. And remember, we know the derivative of sine inverse, right? It's one over, um, you know, u squared or one minus u squared. So that's where that square root comes in and that kind of makes sense. Oh guys, I used a two, it should have been a three. Oh, you probably saw that. Are you yet guys, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I try I try as much as I can to um, confuse you. <laughs> that's like a goal. I'm sure you probably think that's the goal of math teachers. It's not, I promise, promise, promise. All right, so here's the thing with this guy. This guy right here is causing us a problem because I am doing all of this in terms of theta, people. You're not doing this in terms of two theta. So what we have to do here is we have to use the double angle formula. So remember, recall, that the sine of two theta, right, is equal to two sine theta cosine theta. All that stuff that you learned in trigonometry that you thought you weren't gonna use again, look at that, you're using it. Now, why do I have to rewrite it like that? Well, people, you have to rewrite it like that because we are not asking about two theta, we're asking about theta. And it's not as simple as just multiplying the outside by two, right? If you don't remember why this is true, let me know and I will prove it to you, okay? I just, it, it is. <laughs> All right, so now the reason I use that double angle formula is now that gets me something in terms of just theta, which is really, really good. So let's keep going a little bit. I know I'm showing every single step, but that's kind of the idea because I'm your teacher. So I don't like this answer at all. This is kind of giving me the heebie-jeebies a little bit because I have x's and thetas mixed. I really, um, I really don't like that at all. So now we need to figure out what is the sine of theta and what is the cosine of theta. Well, I know three is equal to, no, that's not true. I know that x is equal to three sine theta. Okay, so that's pretty easy. Sine of theta then is x over three. And I'm gonna draw my little triangle here. Nope. Okay, and I'm going to put my theta. I know that sine is opposite over hypotenuse, right? So if I if I want my cosine, I know my cosine is this b right here, my adjacent. So I know 3 squared plus b squared. Nope. Oh, Sarah. Sorry. x squared plus b squared equals 3 squared. So what is my, what is b? What is that side right there? It's going to be the square root of 9 minus x squared. What do you know? That's what was involved in my original substitution. Oh my gosh, you guys, oh my gosh, you guys, we're almost done. So my final answer, sine inverse of x minus two minus, or f x over two, oh, that should be three. My fault, Can you're probably yelling at the computer, my fault. Um, what is sine, uh, sine of theta is x over three, right? What is cosine of theta? So cosine of theta is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's going to be the square root of nine minus x squared all over three. And this whole thing is plus C. And then if you wanted to, you know, you could multiply those together and just get that all over nine. Okay. Or if you wanted to, you could actually, it might be kind of nice to bring that nine halves through because it would actually simplify that pretty nicely. You could do nine halves sine inverse of x over three. When you bring it through and multiply here, the three times three, which is nine, would cancel. So we'd be left with one half x square root of nine minus x squared plus c. That's a little bit cleaner. I like that because we can see that that nine is going to cancel. What do you think? Yeah, do you like it? Do you not like it? Okay, I wanna do one more 
quick one, really quick. I know this is a long one, but that's because trig subs, um, they, they just can be tricky. All right, so let's look at one like this that looks like it's not going to necessarily be a trig substitution, but then we're going to find out it is. So this one you saw, this was like one of the examples at the very end of this section, and this is one where we're going to complete the square. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to complete the square in the bottom to see if I have something that looks like it could be a trig substitution. So I have x squared minus 2x, and then I'm going to kind of put this 10 over here. So to complete the square, remember you take half of that middle term, which would be negative 1, and you square it. So negative 1 squared is positive 1, but if you bring in the positive 1, you better take 1 away because this um, had better stay the same in the ground, right? So look at what we get here. So this whole thing right here, that's the whole reason we did it. That factors into x minus 1 quantity squared. And then the 10 minus 1 is just going to be 9, right? So I'm sorry I, I'm not doing a secant example. Um, but the, you can look in your book and see those secant examples and look on the fun sheet. So why isn't this a secant example? Well, what, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do u substitution first, and watch what's going to happen. If I let u equal x minus 1, du then is dx. Now, I also, this is a definite integral, so I need to make sure that I have my bounds. So when x is 1, notice that u would be 0, and when x is 4, u is 3. So I have this new integral now that's going to go, and because I changed my bounds, I'm not going to come back to x's at all. I'm going to go from 0 to 3, du is just dx, and then on the bottom here, notice I have u squared plus 9. And what do you know this is going to be, this is a trig sub. This actually is quite simple. This isn't even, we could do a trig substitution, but this actually is tangent inverse. Um, maybe we'll just go through the trig sub and you'll see it's tangent inverse. Um, it's pretty easy. We know that that's the, anti, that's the derivative of tangent inverse, but let's do a trig sub just for fun. So what my trig sub would say is that u is 3 tangent of theta, right? Again, if I saw this, I just want to stress I wouldn't do a trig sub. I should get tangent inverse. I better get tangent inverse. <laughs> what is du? du, right, would be 3 secant squared theta d theta. And now I have to change my bounds, right? So when um, u... So when u equals 0, right, that says that 3 tangent of theta equals 0. Or if I divide by 3, that says that tangent of theta is 0. What angle when I take the tangent of it is 0? Well, that would be 0. How about when u is 3, then I have that tangent of theta, 3 tangent of theta equals 3, right? Um, if I divide by 3, I get tangent of theta equals 1. What angle when I take the tangent of it equals 1? That is pi over 4. Okay. All right, so here's what we're going, here's what we get. So I'm going to go from 0 to pi over 4 now, and I'm not going to have to come back. Um, so I guess we won't see that we're going to get tangent inverse. I'm not going to have to come back, right? But we're good to go. 0 to pi over 4. What is du? du is 3 secant squared theta all over. What, what do we get here? I get... Um, I get, uh, let's see, if I square my u, I get 9 tangent squared. You'll see why this is so cool. Plus 9, right, d theta. Now, 9 tangent squared plus 9. If I factor a 9 out, I'm left with tangent squared plus 1. Tangent squared of theta plus 1. And what is tangent squared of theta plus 1? Remember, that is secant squared of theta. That's why we did it. So I'm going from 0 to pi over 4. I have 3 secant squared theta all over 9 secant squared of theta d theta. And now look at what happens. My secant squareds cancel out. Isn't that cool? So what do I have now? 3 over 9 is 1 third. I basically have 1 third um, of, of 1 d theta. So what's the antiderivative of 1 d theta? That would be theta, right, from 0 to pi over 4. So if I had, if this was not a definite integral and I got just theta, remember theta, I would come up here to solve for theta, I would take, divide by 3 and take the inverse tangent. So that's where that inverse tangent would have come from because I already saw that was true over here. It would have been the inverse tangent of um, u over 3, right, because of the 9th. And then the last thing I do is I know theta, I'm going to plug in pi over 4. 
I'm going to plug in 0. When it's 0, it's just 0. So my final answer is pi over 12. So another way that trig substitution can be super helpful, even if it doesn't look like it's supposed to be a trig substitution, right? This didn't really look like it should have been a trig sub, um, but we found out it really was because of if we can complete the square easily, uh, and especially if you complete the square and you notice that this is a perfect square, you guys, that's kind of begging you to do a trig sub with that. Wow, I think this was my longest one yet, but it deserved the extra time. It's a good topic. Please let me know if you have any questions.